Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. In today's special episode, we sat down with two guests, Milton Azradi, chief economist at Vested, and Stephen Scherer, China policy expert and author of Surviving Chinese Communist Detention. They gave their insights into the risks of doing business with a communist regime. Let's dig in. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and speak to your audience today. It's a pleasure to be here. In terms of where China and the U.S. economy stand on the world stage, where do you see that as right now? Well, it's um, it's clearly a great competition. Um, a lot of the media tends to make it something like an athletic competition. It's not like that. Uh, it doesn't matter whether China is slightly bigger or slightly smaller economy than the United States. But there is clearly a competition in two ways. One is for economic influence. And the other is uh, China is trying to change the leadership of the international community, obviously, with it in charge, instead of the United States, which has been the leader of the international community since at least the fall of the Soviet Union. China's economy is centrally planned. And when you consider, say, their central policy and such, how has that served them and where is that leading them today? The... uh, Centrally planned economy in China dazzles a lot of uh, journalists in the West because China can marshal enormous resources uh, to, they have arrays of high-speed locomotives and miles and miles of track. No one seems to care where it goes, but they have miles and miles of track, and this dazzles uh, journalists. And uh, I would like to see uh, more attention to how a free market economy is actually more inventive and safer than a planned economy, even though um, to a lot of people without that uh, in economics background, it seems the exact reverse. This is an old argument. Uh, It's one we had with the Soviet Union. And the fact that the Soviet Union fell apart should have been a warning, but it isn't. To date, the central planning has worked in China's favor. Uh, And I would would characterize it this way. When you're a poor country, underdeveloped, the place where you have to do your work uh, is obvious. You have to build roads and ports and housing and, and so forth, and factories to export to the world. And so the central planning organization in China had a an easy task. But as the economy develops, particularly as, it, as China starts to become an innovative economy instead of an imitating economy, where it was just taking its technology from the West, now it's a, it, it wants to be an innovative economy it has to experiment a lot more. And central planning is not very good at that. And when central planning makes a mistake, unfortunately, um, because it marshals so much of the nation's resources to a single uh, purpose, um, it's a big mistake. One of the reasons China has so much debt today is because of the mistakes that have already been made by, largely by central planning. So it's going to be much harder for China to make the transition to an innovative economy and to make the next step in this great economic competition with the United States if they remain centrally planned. And to quote the great economist Friedrich Hayek, um, nobody is smart enough to figure out the whole economy. And when you are centrally planned, that's what your central planning agency says it can do. So where do you see that leading for the world economy? China has used pure economics up until recently. But because of China's movement as a leader and, and its attempt with the Belt and Road and other means to, um, to effectively take over the leadership that once belonged to the United States, it has become a political economic question. So what are some of the dangers you see if China gains the upper hand? Uh, well, if China gains the upper hand, uh, it's, it is going to be effectively a, um, uh, forgive me for being blunt, a, um, an almost a situation with an empire where China runs the show and everyone else pays tribute or, and, and gets what they can. But everything is done out of Beijing. Uh, now, a lot of people might say the United States did that, and I'm not saying the United States is always equitable in its dealings with people, but the United States primarily was was pushing for free trade until uh, recent times. So why are people, U.S. investors, attracted to the China market and Chinese money? 
Well, uh, U.S. investors and European investors uh, uh, have long been going into China to get a cheap source for uh, their products that they then re-imported from, they've imported from China and sold to their domestic markets. But uh, in the China trade figures that we're seeing now, there is an increasing movement both from the West and other Asian countries uh, toward um, uh, investing in China to get a piece of the large and increasingly rich Chinese market. So the target is Chinese business services and Chinese consumers more than building factories to make widgets to send back to the United States. So you're a U.S. national who went to China to launch a career, and it was going very well until it wasn't. So can you tell us about that? What happened? Yeah, correct. So um, I'm originally from uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, graduated college with a degree in chemistry, um, and ended up wanting to do something different, which is travel. Uh, and so I have two immigrant parents to the United States myself. I've lived and worked around the world. I've been through Latin America, Europe pretty extensively, North America, of course, as well. Uh, and so what I ended up doing was said, hey, you know what, why not China? And I had a job offer on the table to go teach English. So I moved to China where I taught English for about two years. Uh, and then as I lived and worked in China, um, my Mandarin improved. I was studying you know, a lot. Uh, and as my Mandarin improved, I got new opportunities. And then that ended up uh, ultimately um, becoming me co-founding a um, educational consulting firm in Beijing uh, with a Chinese kind of co-founder. Uh, and that was uh, profitable and successful until one day it wasn't. And uh, the, uh, there was a police raid on my office. Uh, they kind of showed up and uh, started asking me a number of different questions. Uh, ultimately, I was detained alongside um, two other foreign nationals in the same office from uh, Germany and Spain uh, around 2016, October of 2016. Uh, and we ended up in a black site Chinese prison. So did they ever tell you why you were detained? Yeah, so uh, it's a great question. When you are initially kind of detained, what happens is there is no formal charge. Uh, so it was very confusing because uh, the kind of proverbial argument used is, well, did you have, did you have the wrong visa or were you on like a student visa? To which I say, no, I had a legal working visa. I did for nearly five years. Um, again, so I was very familiar with the process. I had legal Work, I had a legal work visa, I had an alien permit, um, I had my tax documentation, my incorporation papers, everything. Um, and so when I went through the initial interrogations with police prior to actually being put into a cage uh, in the back of a transport vehicle, uh, they asked me a lot of questions, namely uh, odd questions, which were, how much money are you making in this country? It looks like you're making more than we make. So it took a lot of kind of nonsensical paths. You're not really sure why they're asking you about the amount of money compared to the amount of their income, the amount of money you're earning compared to the uh, salary that they're earning. Uh, and so ultimately, you're kind of thrown into the back of a transport vehicle without any formal charges having brought uh, against you. Uh, and so we were then brought through a litany of different um, police stations, ultimately landing at a processing center at the end of the day. So we've been detained for like 12 hours at that point, uh, where we were finally charged with something. Uh, and it was just an informal, like, here's kind of a paper, sign this. Uh, you're working in the country legally. Now, of course, we tried to protest this and said, you know, I was pointing to, you know, to my documents. So I was like, I have a legal work visa. I have a legal alien permit. I have a business that I've incorporated in China. None, none of my, you have my ta tax documentation. I'm not here legally, but none of that mattered. The security laws in China are incredibly vague. Um, and if they want to detain you, they can detain you. And so um, at the end of the day, we were told what the charge was, which was uh, translates into like illegal employment uh, before being driven then to a black site um, Chinese prison compound. And so you detailed your experience in a book called Surviving Communist Detention. So what was that like being in prison? Everything that you have is taken from you. So when we arrived at the prison compound, uh, what happens is you are stripped down naked, you are marched through metal detectors, all of your belongings are taken from you, you're then put into a nursing station. Uh, no prompts or discussion where nurses come up and start jabbing you, taking your blood, you're then brought into another room. The next room is where you get your eyes scanned through an iris scanner. Um, and finally, you're then brought into another kind of area uh, where you are handed blood scanners 
in blankets uh, and prison guard to sleep on. I was locked up with about 17 inmates on day one. Uh, 24 hours a day, uh, you eat some kind of toxic yellow sludge, which is poured through a funnel through the barred door into a, a red bucket. So you're essentially eating out of a communal trough with 17 other inmates. Uh, you're sharing a single squatter t- uh, toilet. You're forcibly sleep deprived. Uh, you are sleeping on wooden planks that are meant for maybe eight people to hold lights, large fluorescent lamps never turn off. Uh, you're, you know, you've got your bloodstained blankets. There's a lot of people kind of cramped and, you know, kind of laying on top of each, of each other, essentially, because there's just no space. These are very overcrowded prison cells. Uh, and uh, there are you know, no suicide warning signs plastered on the wall. Uh, the two worst things is that you're A, held incommunicado, which means that you have no contact with the outside world, uh, repeatedly asking to contact the U.S. Embassy. You're repeatedly told that you are um, not allowed to contact the U.S. Embassy, uh, A, and then B, you're held indefinitely. Uh, while you are given a formal charge and a period of time that you're meant to spend in the prison cell, uh, what actually ends up happening is that you serve that time and then you as a foreign national get handed over to um, immigration authorities. Uh, one of my cellmates um, from a country in Africa, it's covered in the book, uh, he had been there already for about two and a half months with no contact with his embassy, no contact with the outside world and told it was illegal to even ask that question. Uh, so pretty harsh environments, pretty harsh conditions, forcibly sleep deprived or malnourished within days. Uh, and then this is glossing over the rampant violence. Uh, and then, of course, the uh, water that is routinely shut off, which is, to me, a form of psychological torture. Well, it sounds like a very painful and hard experience. So how did you survive that? A, the ability to speak Mandarin was incredibly helpful. Um, being able to understand what was going on in my cell with the Chinese inmates, with the Chinese guards. Um, Chinese guards routinely pulled me out of my cell Um, to go translate for uh, foreign inmates in other cells who had stopped eating. These conditions are designed to kill you. They are horrific. Uh, And so you can imagine what it must take to take multiple grown men and have them within days stop consuming food. Uh, They're pretty extreme conditions and an understatement. And again, the book Surviving Chinese Chinese Communist Detention goes into more detail about what those experiences were like, Um, the disease, the illness, the violence, the malnutrition, the forced sleep deprivation. Um, but uh, I think being able to speak Mandarin was a huge asset, but also as the guards, the Chinese guards routinely told me, uh, they would often say, you're lucky, Uh, you're lucky you're a U.S. citizen, you're lucky you have a U.S. passport, Um, that might get you out of here faster. And I think that's a big part of it, because a lot of people have this notion that with a U.S. passport, you can go anywhere and be safe. But then your experience kind of shows that's not really the case. So then what happened? Yeah, and I write extensively in the book about my sheer ignorance as a young 22-year-old, where people who were much smarter and wiser than me said, hey, be careful, that's a communist country. And I was really kind of... Uh, lost in my own ignorance, where I thought, you know, hey, I've traveled around the world, I hold multiple passports, I speak different languages, Uh, I'll be safe anywhere. Uh, But the harsh reality is that under China's vague security laws, anyone at any point can be detained for any reason. There will not be formal charges until maybe later in the day or right before they actually detain you. Uh, You can be taken and thrown into these conditions at any point in time for as long as they need you to be held. Uh, These conditions can kill Um, they are dangerous, uh, and, and they are not a place that you, you want to end up. And so you eventually did get deported out. So how did that process come about? There were a number of other nationalities that were locked up in the same general compound uh, from Ghana, from Nigeria, from Pakistan, from India, from Ukraine, Germany, the UK, um, Spain, et cetera, et cetera. There was a kind of UN conference of detainees in these conditions. Um, And so ultimately what happened is immigration got to my case. Um, There was a meeting between a US consular officer from the embassy in Beijing uh, and a Chinese immigration official. Uh, While I was in detention, they kind of pulled me out. We all kind of sat and talked. They explained uh, that I would be being deported at some point. um, And that ultimately um, occurred about a week after Um, the 14-day sentence. So I was lucky. I only spent about 22 days in total um, in these conditions uh, before being deported. And driven 
on a one-way route straight to the airport. Um, you just get your belongings back that were taken from you in detention, uh, and you're kind of then escorted through um, Beijing's airport uh, into the gate, and I was thrown onto a United Airlines flight with a direct flight back to San Francisco and California. And so you said when you were in China, you helped start a company and education center. So what happened to that? Yeah, so I had an educational consulting firm um, that I co-founded with a partner um, as I've been involved in that space for a while. Uh, but right after you're deported, you lose everything. So not only was I deported, I'd spent five years in China. So you can imagine the number of things that I had with me um, that I couldn't take back. But you lose everything. Your job is gone. Your income is gone. Your company is gone. Um, you know, you and on top of everything, you then get, I got slapped with a three year travel ban. Uh, so everything is just kind of gone overnight. And so with your background and like as an example of the human rights abuses that happen and with, say, scandals with Luckin and Didi recently, why do you think American investors continue funneling money into China? And I think there are a lot of people who look at the short term gains from an investment perspective and assume and kind of gloss over the long term recurring themes that we see with investment in China. You're going to kind of suffer the fate of the three R's, which is that number one, you will be replicated. Uh, number two, you will be replaced. And number three, you will be removed. Uh, so why the people continue to do this, um, I'm not sure, but there are so many iterations of my story, uh, whether it's me, small business people, uh, Tesla, Uber, or other kind of global multinationals, uh, the long-term result almost 100% of the time is the same, is that you end up losing, uh, being replaced, or removed. Well, they think that they have great growth opportunities despite the scandals, and they're taking the risk. Um, Risk is the name of the game. Um, there was, um, uh, and so they, if they, th if they think, even if they're banned in the global community, even if they're stopped in the West for some reason, they have a huge, huge market in China, and people feel if I have an investment there, I will have a piece of that market too. And so many of these Chinese companies are tied to the Chinese Communist Party and help fund the military. But even with those risks and, say, human rights abuses, a lot of American investors continue to pour money into these companies. Why do you think that is? Well, I think there's a lot of growth potential in China. It's a large market. There's a lot of business there. And um, they're not thinking about politics. And they may be deluding themselves that they can protect themselves. Um, if they're a passive investor, then it's just money, and they're making the profit on the growth of the Chinese economy, which should continue faster than most of the Western economies for some time to come. Uh, but really, they're being, uh, they're, they're just looking for their profits. They may say to themselves, if we put this money up, we can make an adequate gain in three years or five years, and that's enough time. So what are some things America or, say, free markets can do to kind of even the playing field? Well, um, it's an interesting thing, and I'm not a, a great fan of Donald Trump, but a lot of people say he was destroying free trade when he put the tariffs on. But even Adam Smith, who is the grandfather of free trade in economic theory, said that tariffs have a use to force the hand of someone who is operating in an inequitable way. And that is the way the United States saw China. That is the way I saw China's behavior. And those tariffs have done something, because you can see in U.S. bilateral trade that China is abiding by the agreement, at least the first phase of the agreement they signed with Trump just before the uh, COVID pandemic hit. So how are the policies at home affecting our standing in the global stage? Well, um, from a soft power point of view, the, the dissension in the United States, both uh, the, the culture wars and the, um, and the uh, uh, harsh divide in Washington, are weakening U.S. leadership because people, in, in two ways, one, they see the United States as weaker as a consequence of that, but two, they feel like they can't predict what the United States is going to do. And I think there's a feeling that the United States is not going to behave in a consistent way from one year to the next, one administration to the next, the way it had in the past. 
So how is that going to affect the global economy? Well, I think it makes it much harder for the United States to make trade uh, deals with other countries because the United States may change its mind. Um, and uh, the, so in that respect, it, it hurts the United States. The rise of China, however, and the fear that instills in some countries like Japan and increasingly in Europe, not so much fear of an invasion, but fear of economic uh, uh, overlordship, uh, is driving people toward the United States because it is the only alternative. It is the only it's a nation economy with enough heft with the help of allies to uh, counter China. And so we had, I think it was very interesting that the first international meeting in the United States was between Japan and President Biden. They want to say to China, our alliance is that much stronger than you think our alliance. And, and we talked about economic cooperation at that meeting. I think it was both the, the whole conversation, even though it was addressed to domestic audiences, was aimed at Beijing. What do you think free markets can do to kind of combat that? Well, it's very hard to combat the political influence or the influence, for instance, of getting someone to apologize for something uh, that they should not apologize for uh, or to bend to uh, uh, party rules. It's very hard to do that because the government can't order an American company how to talk and what to say. I think the best combat uh, against this is to alert another uh, market, which is the domestic market in the United States. And um, so the business people, what they have to do is be confronted with a counterweight on the other side. So if you want to gain in the Chinese market and you bow to the Chinese Communist Party, you will lose influence in the United States. Consumers, if they don't boycott you, they will avoid you. And if Hollywood does too much of Chinese bidding, they will lose their audience in the United States. Now, I understand the audience in China is bigger. Maybe they won't care. Um, but that is probably the only way we can do it. The biggest kind of problem right now is that we're funding our own demise uh, through these kind of channels that go back into the Chinese coffers. Uh, and that money is then used to attack us through all the different mediums that were originally written about and discussed in books like Unrestricted Warfare that were written by the PLA to literally destroy and replicate the United States. And also being kind of well read on the subject, whether that's my book, whether that's other books that are kind of written about the issues that are happening with China, the ongoing relations with the United States and China, um, but really kind of curbing that investment and putting that money into other free countries, democratic countries that value human rights, like India, like Japan, like South Korea, like Singapore, uh, or other countries outside of Asia that kind of mirror the same philosophy. That's a huge thing that we could be doing right now. And we have to all advocate for that. So in your opinion, where does China stand in the global economy today? And where do you think it's headed? China's stuck between a rock and a hard place. Look, on one end of the spectrum, they're growing very fast. They have a massive, or they grew very fast. They have a massive population. Um, but I think a lot of the economic realities that other countries, all countries at some point have to deal with, uh, which is a tapering population, which is slower economic growth, are going to catch up. And so China made a promise to its citizenry that it will make them wealthy, that it will open them and make them the kind of jewel in the crown to the world. But what happens when that is no longer viable? What happens when there's a pause or a reset or a slowdown. Um, and China, the CCP specifically, will have will be in a very difficult place. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Great to have you on the show. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate it. Thank you for the time. And for those just tuning in, that was today's special episode with guests Milton Ezradi, chief economist at Vested, and Stephen Scherer, China policy expert and author of Surviving Chinese Communist Attention. Thanks for watching and see you next time.